got joy in the struggle. I've got peace in the storm. I've got strength in the battle. I don't fear anymore. I'm a child of heaven, and my hope is secure. I've got joy, because I've got Jesus. He gave me beauty for ashes, turned my life around. He broke my chains, and now I dance on solid ground. For all he's done to save me, I will raise my voice. I've got Jesus, so I've got joy. been paid. Then he said to my dry bones, rise up out of that grave. He has all of my worship, all of my honor and praise. I've got joy, cause I've got Jesus.
Yeah. For the break of day, I asked the Lord to make me whole. He holds me, and the Lord, He keeps me. I can't go on Thank you Jesus Thank you all day long Late in the midnight hour I talk to my God Joy Sing it like you mean it. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Thank you, O oh Lord, for the joy that comes from our salvation in you. Thank you, O oh Lord, for being the source of our joy. I pray now that Ricky might die, that Christ might speak, hide me behind the cross. May the words be heard be the words of a risen Savior who offers both spirit and life everlasting. For it is in his name and for his sake that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome, my friends, to the virtual worship of First Baptist Church West today on this, the third Sunday of the month. I trust and pray and hope that you've had a great and wonderful week, and thank you so much for joining us in our worship today. In North Carolina, this week, early voting started, and so I would encourage you, if you have not already made your way to the polls, to educate, you, educate yourself on the choices and make sure that you go out to make your voice heard to vote for the candidate of your choice. Well, there's a word today that I want to lift that is found in the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, chapter 6, begin reading at verse 1. It is a familiar passage. But with your prayers and God's help, we will look to draw new water from a familiar well. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. When the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near, and therefore, Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, he said to Philip, 
Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are these for so many? Jesus said, Have the people to sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in the number of about 5,000. Jesus then took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated. Likewise, also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were filled, he said to the disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Pray with me, if you will, for a little while today from this subject, starting from scratch. Starting from scratch. Starting from scratch is how Bill Gates built Microsoft. Gates dropped out of Harvard to test an idea about the means of making computer programming easier, and particularly for the new personal computers that had just been invented. The initial program he and his partners created was still being written on the way to their meeting to make a pitch to the buyer. Without testing the program and knowing for sure that it would work, they made their pitch, demonstrated their pro what their program can do, and the rest is history, and they started from scratch. But Steve Jobs also started from scratch, working in his garage to build Apple into a household brand. And Jeff Bales started from scratch with Amazon, with a small investment from his parents to buy used books and sell them online. All three men made a fortune and changed the world with their businesses, but it all started from scratch with nothing more than a simple idea. Never discard the power of an idea. When all you have is an idea, sometimes you have all you need. So much of the change in this world for the better all started with an idea and with persons starting from scratch. One of the people I think that gets overlooked in the feeding of the multitude by Jesus is Andrew. You see, Andrew is not a part of the inner circle of the disciples. He's never the one that is closest to Jesus. Andrew appears to be perfectly fine operating in the background. It is Andrew who brings his brother Peter to Jesus and tells him that we have found the Messiah. It is Andrew that Greeks visiting Jerusalem come to see him and tell him that we would see Jesus. Andrew is always connecting people to the master and letting God to decide what to do with the connection. Therefore, we should not be surprised that when the crisis of a meal for the crowd arrived, Andrew would be the one disciple to play a critical part. When Jesus sees the crowd and their need for food because they had been with him all day away from available resources of food and water, he asks Philip, where are we to go to find food for the people? And Philip turns Jesus' question of where to what? Jesus asks where to go to find food, but Philip immediately begins to talk about how much is needed. And even that will only go a little bit. He begins to calculate how much would be required to give the people a little. He's concerned not about where, but what. And changing the question asked of us, is the way that we yield power to the opposition. 
Changing the question asked of us is always a distraction to keep us from what we should be our primary focus. Because Philip was so focused on what as opposed to where, he failed to consider that he was already in the presence of the one that could meet his need. Philip's focus on what made him miss the obvious, that when we're in the presence of the Almighty, we are already where we need to be. Without anyone asking, Andrew begins to go to work looking for a solution to the problem. Andrew is aware of a lad with a single lunch of two fish and five loaves. And how Andrew makes this discovery, we're not told. Maybe he observed the lad with the lunch earlier during the day. Maybe he went out on a quick search to see what resources could be found within the crowd. And maybe someone in the crowd informed him about the lad. We don't know how he found the lunch, but we do know Andrew did. And whatever the case may be, it is Andrew who comes up with the single lunch of two fish and five barley loaves, and he offers it to Jesus. And although Andrew makes the discovery of the lunch and informs Jesus, he still has doubts about what could happen since they're starting from scratch. What are they among so many? Jesus takes what Andrew has discovered, instructs the disciples to manage the crowd, and then performs one of the greatest miracles recorded in the Bible. Amen. And it all started starting from scratch. What can we learn about starting from scratch? First, starting from scratch acknowledges that we have to start somewhere. What I love about this miracle is that the miracle only comes after Andrew discovers the single lunch. There is work that Andrew puts in when he's made aware of the problem. Andrew does not wait to be asked to do something, nor does he refuse to do anything because the problem seems too big. He simply does what he can do even when it does not appear to be enough. Andrew does not allow himself to be pulled into the debate about how the disciples and the crowd got in the position of being away from home without resources. Andrew does not look to assign blame. Jesus should not have held a service so long. The crowd should have known that they, what they needed in order to get ready to eat. And more people should have been prepared for the possibility of needing food along the way this far from the city. It is not our fault that this large crowd out here in the middle of nowhere has neither food nor water. That is not our issue. In fact, some disciples tell Jesus to send the crowd away. We do not have enough for ourselves. Andrew does not participate in any of those things that could distract him, but does what he can do by finding what is available, and he makes Jesus aware of what he found. Starting is always the hard part, because too often we are so focused on the outcome that the journey of discovery that changes us and others along the way is often missed. Because Andrew got started and found what was available to, and gave it to Jesus, he placed a lad in a position to see what Jesus could do with his lunch. And if Jesus can do all of that with my lunch, what in the world could Jesus do with me? Because Andrew got started, he showed the disciples their need to put their faith to work through their actions. And because Andrew got started, the crowd got to see it's not so much about what you have, but whose hand you put it in. When we take what we have and put it in the hands of the master, he's able to do more than we can imagine or think. Andrew did not let the problem block him from the possibility. Starting from scratch, says we see what is possible and never forget we have to start somewhere 
But where we start is not necessarily where we end up. Starting from scratch begins by understanding that and knowing that we have to start somewhere. But second, starting from scratch does not mean that we won't have doubts. I don't think Andrew should be condemned for his doubts, but celebrated for his honest humanity. Lord, I found something. I'm going to give it to you, but I'm not sure it will help. What are they among so many? Andrew's question to Jesus that voiced his doubts has been heard over and over through the centuries. What are they among so many? It was said during women's suffrage and the fight for desegregation, what are they among so many? It's been said in the fight for fair housing and equal employment opportunity, what are they among so many? It has been said in our private battles, when we have had more month than money, more medicine than a cure, more questions than an answer, what are they among so many? There is so much about life that we do not have the answers to in advance. There's so many times when we go out wondering if what we're doing makes a difference. Sometimes it appears that we're trying to empty the ocean with a spoon, trying to climb a mountain with one arm tied behind our back, or trying to navigate through a dark valley without any light. Andrew is honest about his doubts, but he does not allow his doubts to paralyze him, nor is he afraid to confess his doubts because he knows that Jesus can handle his doubts. Jesus does not have an ego problem that causes him to turn away from us because of our doubts. Jesus welcomes us to come to him in our full honesty about our hopes and our struggles. Andrew's doubts and our own doubts provide a unique opportunity to see what Jesus can do with us even when we are marred by doubts. The doubts of a father about a cure for his son did not keep Jesus from healing the boy. The doubts of Mary about being the vessel that God would use to bring his son into the world did not keep God from using her. And must I say it, even Jesus' own doubts at Gethsemane as he prayed that a cup of bitterness would pass did not keep the father from honoring his word and showing his faithfulness. Starting from scratch, we may have doubts along the way, but God knows how to handle our doubts and to show us what is possible when we just come Thank to you, him. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Now finally, starting from scratch is how we give God something to work with. I'm amazed if what I've seen possible only because someone gave another something to work with. When I was a kid, I loved snow days. Days when school was out because of snow. Now, that was not a day to sleep late. It wasn't a day to watch television all day. We didn't have video games or cell phones, so we couldn't sit in our room looking at TikTok. We had to go outside and play in the snow. In fact, my mama would get us up early, put our boots out, get our coats out, give us some oatmeal and say, go on outside and play. <laughs> so we would sled in the snow. We'd have snowball fights in the snow. We would build a snowman. And by the end of the day, when we were tired and wore out from playing all day in the snow, we would gather some fresh snow and bring it to give to my mother, who would then make the best ice cream I had ever had from snow. <laughs> Sometimes she would even bake homemade cookies to go with the snow cream. Boy, those were the days. 
I still find it hard to believe what my mother was able to do, not just for me, but for me and my friends, but by just giving her some snow. The same snow that we had played in all day became a new source of blessing to us because we brought what we had to somebody else who knew how to make something else out of it and bless not just me, but all of my friends along the way. <laughs> I feel my help coming now. I know another who knows how to take the little that we give him and turn it into a blessing beyond our imagination. I know another who knows how to work with what comes from scratch. From scratch, he formed the world and painted the stars. From scratch, he scooped up the dirt and formed a man in his image. I know another who took the brokenness of humanity because of sin and on the cross of Christ purchased our redemption. I know another who still hears a faint cry, who still wipes a tear-stained eye, who still mends a broken heart, who still makes a way out of no way. I know another that if we bring whatever we have to him, he can make something else out of it. And Jesus is his name. Thank you, Jesus. The same Jesus that took fish and loaves that day and fed a multitude, did so when someone was willing to start from scratch. And that same Jesus is willing to take whatever you give him, even if you're starting from scratch, and provide a blessing that you could not imagine or conceive. Thanks be to God for his glory and for his grace. Let's pray. Father, thank you for a word that challenges but also inspires. Thank you for the knowledge that of no matter where we are in our lives, we have something that we can bring to you. And even though it may not look like much to us, when it leaves our hands and enters yours, you can do so much with it. Honor your word now. May it not return into you for it. May it serve the purpose that you desire and design that the glory might be yours, both now and forever. In the matchless name of Jesus our Christ we pray, and for his sake. Amen. 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 Well, my friends, know that God indeed uses ordinary people. People like you and me. I trust and pray and hope that you have been inspired, but also challenged today. I pray and hope and trust that this day will get you moving in the direction that you need to move in. And trust God to do what only God can do. Know that he can handle your doubts and your concerns because he loves you with an everlasting love. Well, my time is up. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you'll join us again next week. And I look forward to sharing with you again a rich and wonderful word from the scriptures next week at First Baptist Church West. Have a great week.